Hello, and welcome to this episode of Gardening in the City. I'm Kane Adams, and I'm with the City of Urban Environmental Department. And today we're going to do a little something different. Uh, today we've got Rutherford County historian Greg Tucker along with us to talk about Murphy Springs. Okay. Thank Good you for being with you this morning. We're standing in one of the prettiest garden spots, I think, in the city. And uh, all pretty much volunteer, I think. Uh, I'm looking at a pretty cottonwood and uh, a lot of ash, hickory, beautiful. We are, of course, standing on a, the platform that was built uh, as a viewing platform for the Murphy Spring which was part of the uh, Discovery Center development about 10 years, 15 years ago. I think the first thing that I'd want to be sure people take away from it is what we see now is virtually all man-made. Uh, if we go back 200 years, this area would look very, very different. There still would be a water flow, but uh, the, the plants, the terrain, the lay, the level and all has changed dramatically several times as Murfreesboro has developed. Uh, Prehistory, before Tennessee was a state, in that period, well, probably before we saw the British uh, colonial kind of migration coming in here, uh, there's just a few things we know. One thing we know is this was kind of a rest stop on what was called the Nickajack Trace, or some of us call it the War Trace. Uh, that was a, more of an English term for it. But from the French Lick up in Nashville to the north of us, was an Indian trail, came through here, went to what we call the Black Fox Spring Camp area, on down uh, through uh, the Old Stone Fort, which is an archeological mystery still, and then on down towards Chattanooga where the Cherokee towns were, the Nickajack area. So it was traveled on foot and mostly by the Native American population at the time. Uh, another thing I think is interesting is the name of the area. We take for granted this is Murphy Springs, always been Murphy Springs. We don't know what it was called back then because the Murphy name, of course, came with the uh, North Carolina land grants okay. originally. It brought Murphy over here. And uh, I think it's interesting that Colonel Hardy Murphy did not get for his service any grants in the area. But as the grants were being awarded to those that were under his command originally, he started buying them. He apparently was speculating in land in Tennessee. He had a family fortune from many years before. And in fact, it's interesting if you look at some of the deeds where he was buying from the privates and the lieutenants and such that uh, he could make contact with. He's paying for many of them with British pounds. He's still using the money of the defeated foe and buying land. He bought heavily in Davidson, Williamson, and Rutherford County. And uh, so we know that the earliest contact with this area, uh, there's no telling what they call it except the springs. And of course they were talking about not only the one behind us in the cave, but the one uh, down the way that we now call Sand Spring. Uh, so the Murphy name probably showed up uh, after 1800. And uh, I mentioned in passing that probably the biggest land scandal in the history of the Southern United States was the land grants being given out by, by North Carolina. He ended up, uh, the fellow who was signing them ended up doing a little prison time over there. <laughs> but Hardy Murphy apparently managed to keep his and keep it clean, uh, uh, which is not true of all the grants in Rutherford County. Uh, but what we had when the Indians were coming through here was uh, two very inviting springs. And the one behind us is what we call today the Murphy Spring. And I don't think it looks at all like what it would have been during that, that period. Now there's uh, some folklore behind this too that I, I might want to get you to elaborate on about uh, Chief Black Fox supposedly swimming down from Black Fox Swamp and popping up over here. Is that any way possible? The Black Fox story is a pure fable. We know from accounts of a number of the early historians that there was a Cherokee chief named Black Fox. His Indian name was Enoli, or Enoli, how, how pronounced. And uh, he traded with the early settlers and led hunting parties through the area. And most of his trading was done out at uh, what now is called the Black Fox Spring area to the south of here. And uh, I, I've read several different stories all kind of around the same theme. 
uh, the one written by John Spence, who was a diarist during the period, uh, 1870s, uh, talks about how Black Fox led his hunting party in there and uh, came upon or was set upon by another rival tribe uh, in uh, their hunting party. His group was overwhelmed, and to make a good story, they had Black Fox jump into the water and disappear, never to be seen again, in order to avoid being captured. Well, that version of the story doesn't hold up because Black Fox is very much alive over the next 20 years because he's the principal contact between the, the white settlers and the Native Americans. In fact, he signed the treaty, which gave everything north of the Tennessee River to the uh, uh, settlers. And in exchange, he was promised $1,000 a year for the rest of his life. Uh, and we see his name in East Tennessee. We see his name in Oklahoma. So he apparently prospered thereafter, <laughs> having made the deal. Uh, the other story, which is one that uh, many of us have heard, has Black Fox camping at the spring. And he is uh, come upon by Captain Orr and his militia, who are on their way to Nickajack to discipline the Indians there who've been raiding. At least they thought they were. The, the sad part of the story is it was actually uh, the Choctaw who had been causing the trouble, but uh, Orr was going down to discipline the Cherokee. Uh -huh. There is an actual account written by Orr or his uh, adjutant. They came down from Nashville, passed through here, and camped at Black Fox Springs. Encountered no Indians whatsoever. The next day proceeded to Nickajack. But in that story, Black Fox, in order to escape his uh, assailants, jumps in, swims underground, and emerges here at Murphy Spring. Not only is that humanly not possible, uh, several miles underground would be the story, uh, but Black Fox Spring rises having come from south at the spring and then flows as a surface creek north. So if he had done any swimming, he would have been swimming in, in view of his assailants there. So obviously that's not what, that's not what happened. So that's not a true story? <clears throat> not at all. In fact, the first story, give me a little commercial here. My first story in the book that's just been published by the Rutherford County Historic Society deals with that and cites the several different versions of the story and then uh, explains how it couldn't quite happen. It's quite likely, though, that some of the water at least a portion of the flow out of the spring here uh, is coming from the hills to the south because we know it's all flowing north towards the Stones River watershed. Now you had said that years, years ago you didn't imagine this area to look anything like this and it looks like you can see some man-made walls, stone down there. What would you envision this to look like back in the you know 1700s, early 1800s? Well, even as late as the 1950s, this looked very different. The cave mouth was more open. Uh, the retainer wall for catching water probably was built uh, well after the area was settled, but before my time. But the cave mouth was more open. There was a deep, deep uh, reservoir of water here, overflowing to make the creek, but also uh, there was a sinkhole that uh, we all said had no bottom. Going off, that would be to my right facing the spring. Uh, and water very, very deep there, and there was flow into that sinkhole. Uh, after a tragic uh, accident where a 12-year-old drowned, he and two buddies came down here swimming in about 1964, and uh, the two of them decided not to jump in. He stripped off, jumped in. The water is very, very cold, and the theory is he either had cramps or was shocked by the water and disappeared. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jim Haynes, was called in. He had the only scuba equipment uh, in the area at the time, and he recovered the body. But thereafter, the city came in and dumped large rock into the mouth of the cave to obstruct that. Water can still flow out, but you can't get very far. Talk to people, though, that have been back in the cave before that time. There's a real cave back there, opened up quite, quite big up under the hill here. And then they dumped enough rock into the pool so that you can walk in there. Uh, again, the water's still going down and across, but they changed it dramatically that way. 
Now when we talk about the role of the spring in terms of the development of Murfreesboro, we need to again remember we're not sure what spring we're talking about. But in 1812, when the site for Murfreesboro was selected, there were certain criteria that had to be met. One was a source of good water. And uh, I've read a number of things where they talk about the Murphy Spring providing that. That's not correct. If you read the early writings, they were really looking at the spring we'll hopefully visit down the way called Sand Springs for the water source. Uh, and even in the earliest times of Murfreesboro, when they said Murphy Springs, I'm not sure which they were referring to or were they referring to it collectively. It was still later before we kind of designated this one Murphy Spring and the other. <clears throat> but now we know there's two different springs, but we couldn't tell exactly which one they were talking about at that time in history. At that time, uh, although we know as the city developed, it's the Sand Spring uh, that, that they went to for the, for the water source. So was there any inhabitants here prior to Murfreesboro being settled? Well, as I said, the property had been granted to, uh, or he had, uh, Hardy Murphy had obtained the grants. So it was his property. But there were squatters. And uh, some people think, well, there was a little community called Cannonsburg. No, Cannonsburg never existed. Uh, but there were squatters. And you'll read occasionally where so-and-so near the Murphy Spring or the Murphy Springs area, uh, as long as that. It wasn't until after Hardy Murphy died that his will was probated that Lavinia Murphy, who married Burton, or Mr. Burton, uh, it was clear that this was on their property. And the mansion up the hill from us is uh, the original location of the Burton Mansion. It was probably at that time that it began to be identified as Murphy Springs. But before then, a fellow named Henderson, who was an interesting entrepreneur, uh, he was over in, I think, the Columbia area originally. But he became aware that people were beginning to settle around this area. He came over here and set up what we call a subscription school, essentially a private school, and was supporting himself by taking whatever compensation he could from some of the people squatting in the area to educate their kids. And of course, once uh, the ownership was clear, they cleared off the squatters. But by that time, Murfreesboro was beginning to develop. And Henderson, as far as I say, he was a good entrepreneur. He got the locals to build him a little cabin log structure for his school. Uh, but, you know, it's not in use on, Saturday, on Sundays. So he also set up a church <laughs> and uh, was, was our first, uh, so to speak, uh, preacher in the area doing Sunday services, taking up a collection. Uh, when Murfreesboro was settled, or set, as to where it was, this of course wasn't in Murfreesboro originally, this was still out uh, in the country. Uh, he moved his church into town and it eventually became the first Presbyterian church, one of our biggest and certainly yeah. one of our oldest congregations. The one that's now down right off the square, correct? Yeah, now when he went in, he, he initially was not on the square or where we associate, uh, but after his congregation began to grow, they built the church over what now is the city cemetery. Okay. And uh, again, he was squatting, but uh, that's, where, that's where he landed. So when you say this area was out in the county at that time, where was the actual, was Murfreesboro at the square and this was in yeah. the county? Remember Murfreesboro built around 60 acres and the corner of Murfreesboro pointing this way is right in the middle of the intersection where Vine Street and the Broad come together. Okay. That was the lower corner. And then everything outside was still held by the grantees, which were Murphy, all the way around. And uh, I've always been pretty confident that the real choice of the site was it's shepherded by the heirs of Hardy Murphy because they knew they owned everything over here with the exception of what Lyle had on one corner. So I believe they were the ones probably that moved the legislature and the, and the commissioners to select the site they did. But except for some encroachment that was Lytle there, the Murphy land was not taken for the city but completely encircled the city and that included this area over here. So the, the Burtons, Murphy uh, in-laws, controlled these springs. So you can see how they had the grip on the town because mm -hmm. they controlled the water supply. All right, well, before we get to walking, I want to 
ask you a question. You see a man-made hole back there. Is that part of the springs or how is that incorporated into this area? Well, that's a good uh, indication of how this area has changed even in recent years. Uh, that obviously is a culvert or a drain built uh, and draining from what would be to the southeast of us here. Uh, and that accounts for a significant more water in here after a heavy rain or, or something. But when they opened up the uh, subdivisions, the business area south of Mercury Boulevard, they had a lot of water problem. And that's part of the system uh, beginning with the uh, Chelsea Apartments and in that area. They brought it over here. I mean, it was beginning to be a wetlands. Water was beginning to stand over here, so this was a place to dispose of the water. But that's all man-made, and that's part of what I mean when I say it's a man-made wetlands. I mean, it's a, it's a habitat, it's, a, it's an arboretum, and it's a beautiful place to just spend some time, but it didn't happen naturally. Gotcha. And uh, they're still adding to it. In the, in the last 10 years or 15 years that I've been involved with the Discovery Center and had occasion to be here, I can see the water uh, significantly deeper now than it was then, and, uh, and flowing slower particularly as you get on down, which I think uh, you would understand better than me how that affects the, the uh, animal and plant life in the yep. area. Yep. Well, what do you say we talk about going downstream? Let's go ahead and take a walk downstream and see what we can get into. All right, go ahead. Well, here's the only commercial structure in what we call the wetlands now, the radio tower. Back in 1947, Senior Cecil Elrod decided to bring uh, Rutherford County into the 20th century communications and they got a license for a radio station. So what was the purpose of the radio station? Was it, did they, did they play music or was it communication wise? Or? Well, he, the purpose was to make money for Mr. Elrod. <laughs> uh, and uh, he focused on, as they do now, the community activity. And uh, uh, they wouldn't let him name it or put the call letters on it that he wanted initially. He wanted to be WCOW because we were real proud as a community of our uh, status in terms of the dairy industry. And, uh, you know, we had the, one of the biggest creameries in the United States making cheese, and then we had uh, Carnation making evaporated milk. Right. And, uh, but the uh, forerunner of the FCC said no, so he went to WGNS, Good Neighbor Station. Well, I'm willing to walk out on a limb here and say I don't think that's probably the original tower there, is it, Mr. Tucker? Uh, you're right. You're <laughs> right. This tower, uh, I, in my lifetime, this tower has been built. But uh, the original tower was damaged, I believe, by wind, and they came back and put in. And you can see the old footings of the older tower. Uh, the original tower also had a broadcast booth though, so uh, people that uh, were on the air could be right here at the base of the tower sometimes. Sand Springs area, what they used to call the yeah. Rose Water Works. Well, they highlight Rose Water Works because it's a curious story, but this is Sand Springs. If you read the Spence Annals, this uh, diarist who was writing in about 1870, he describes Sand Springs as a beautiful picnic area. He talks about the water literally bubbling up through a hole between the rocks, bringing up a pure white sand, and the water being very, very pure and sweet because it had you know, uh, come through the sand, come up through the sand. He also describes how there was a rocky bluff all around the spring and that it was laced with caves and caverns and such and even served as a playground, he recalls, for some of the kids. Hmm. And uh, all that obviously has disappeared. Now we know what happened to the rock when they started building the courthouse, the churches and the main <coughs> buildings around the square. They quarried it out of here. It was convenient, close by, just the type of rock they needed apparently for the foundations. So they literally took down the hill and all the uh, 
uh, caverns and such disappeared disappeared along the way. Was this the original water source for the city? Yeah, we talk of, as we mentioned earlier, we talk of Murphy Springs being so significant, but it really was Sand Springs because that was the more effusive supply of water and they apparently were more confident of the purity of the water than they were for that coming out of the cave. So for 50 years, the early times in Murfreesboro, they'd come down here in wagons and barrels and with pails filled the barrels and that was the water supply. Uh, and we see descriptions of water being carried uh, like we see in the, some of the native uh, pictures, you know, on their head or right. back, what have you. Uh, well, they tried uh, to figure out a way to move the water without all the man and animal power involved. And that's what the Rose Waterworks was called, Rose being the name of one, one of the several investors. And the idea was to catch water out of the sand spring uh, raise it up high enough. He tried to raise it about 45 feet above grade so that then would gravity flow up to the courthouse, the huh. square. Okay. And if you walk from here to the square, it's uphill. Yes. So they had to get some height. Uh, it didn't work. It's uh, typical of what I call a Rube Goldberg device. Too complicated, too dependent on mechanical movement and such as that. So what happened to the water to make it to make it not a valid source once it got up there? Well, if you'll, if you'll notice, the, uh, once it got to the top of the elevated area, it flowed either in pipes laying on the ground or shallow in the ground. In any event, the water wasn't very appetizing, very appealing when it got up there. Uh, at Sand Springs, the water was cool cold, fresh, and by the time it got to the courthouse, it was not very appealing. Uh, I think the, the constant breakdowns and such as that is what prompted them to, to give it up. So once the Sand Springs was abandoned as a water source, what did they use for a water source, or how was, what, what did Sand Springs do? What was its function after that? Well, the city really depended on its wells. The city then and still today sits on quite a bit of uh, underground water. And there are, uh, I could show you a dozen different locations where there were wells, one right on the courthouse square, mm -hmm. one that's been recently uncovered over where they're doing the, the new judiciary building. Right. Uh, and that really was what they were depending on, that and cisterns. Every roof would have a drain into a cistern, usually underground, and that was the water supply. The Sand Springs, uh, the history here got sadder. Uh, this was during the time that Huggins owned the Sand Springs. Uh, he leased it to the new railroad, which would put it just before the Civil War. Uh, and uh, the railroad came in and dug out around the Sand Spring and built a rock enclosure to catch water. So there'd be standing water there rather than it flowing on out. Uh, and they used that water for the old steam engines. But in so doing, they destroyed everything around the spring. So the quality of the water was diminished, but also we began to develop the mud hole, okay. which eventually turns into our wetlands. And that was really the beginning of the mud hole. And when uh, Guy James Sr. got a hold of the property, he let it grow back up because he was uh, pasturing for his cattle on it and probably using the water for the animals. But uh, Sand Springs at that point uh, was no longer a uh, picnic area, no longer anything that you would take your family to. It was, it was a mud hole. So at that point, pretty much its use in history was, is done. That's right. Uh, now, it still fed what uh, we now call either the Murphy Spring uh, Branch or it came to be called the Town Creek. Okay because the flow, what, what flow there was out of Sand Spring joins with the flow from the Murphy Cave and looped up into what is now uh, where the city hall and such as that is, it was up, uh, up to the base of the hill and then looped back and flowed into Lytle. And a lot of the industry built up all along Town Creek because that was their septic system. Well, let's hold that thought about Town Creek because I think that's gonna be our next stop. So let's go ahead and make our way on that way.
moving downstream from Sand Springs and here behind us is Town Creek. Can you tell us a little bit about how Town Creek was set up years ago? Well, Town Creek is what uh, many of them came to call it because it was flowing up through quite a bit of the industrial area on this side of town. Uh, in fact, I counted, looking at a 1910 map one time, there were at least six little bridges where the creek kept going under Castle Street, Walnut Street, Front Street, uh, Church Street, and all the little streets, Maple, up in that area. And uh, the industrial development following the Civil War followed that creek because they all used the creek as their waste disposal channel. Oh. And uh, in the late 1940s, when the Broad Street project was underway, is when they, uh, one of the motives was to try to clean up Town Creek, and uh, so it wasn't such a, such a health hazard as it had developed. What you see right here is the outflow from what was, I assume by then, already developing as a wetlands because of the way it had been damaged up to that point. Uh, but I'm not convinced that what appears to be the uh, creek bed now was the creek bed then because as, the, as it has silted in, filled in, and been overworked, the, the creek bed has shifted around. Just kind and of it, constantly <coughs> moved the entire yeah, time. Yeah, moving around. But this put it underground and uh, also they channeled it away from uh, everything on the other side of what's now Broad Street. So it actually goes under Broad now from where you see and then runs up Hickerson, goes yep. under the, if you know the subway shop and a couple yep. of things there, it kind of cuts up under there and then goes down Hickerson. And uh, I've read somewhere where it said and goes into its uh, original mouth there beside Cannonsburg. I'm not convinced of that because clearly we channelized a straight shot when it rises above yep. out of the culvert again into uh, uh, Lytle Creek. The interesting thing about the mouth, if that's where it was originally, is that's the point zero the surveyor used to lay out Murfreesboro. Again, that's outside of the original Murfreesboro, but he had to have a, a point where he could start measuring from. Okay. So the first corner uh, nearest there was so many feet or meters or rods, whatever he was using from that point. I'd like to see a marker there, something that tells us this was the the zero point so the that's got survey. a tremendous amount of historical oh yeah yeah and uh, assuming that the mouth is is where it was and I've no reason to believe it wasn't but it's hard to be sure too because it was channelized and moved around so much before it got to Lytle Creek well when we were talking about sand springs I'm reminded of the old saying everything changes but nothing really changes uh, we have of writing done many, many years ago, specifically about Sand Springs that I want to share with you. The question, where are those moss-covered rocks, the tall shading trees, and the little fairy caves so often visited by the little boys? The answer, time and improvement has swept them all away, blasted, gone. Should the person who had seen these springs many years ago return again to see them, would likely deny they were in the same place an account of the great change. The once heavy timber standing around the springs, all gone. The rock, they too had disappeared. Scarcely anything remained to remind us these were the places of retreat on a hot summer evening. That was written in 1870 by John C. Spence, who uh, tells us about the original Sand Springs. We talked today about what we lose and what we gain with development and uh, how it changes our environment, improves our environment, but we're always losing a little something. As much as it's changed, as much as it isn't what it was, it's still beautiful and a great place to take a walk. Absolutely, I, I, it really looks good. And Mr. Tucker, I really do appreciate you coming on here and giving us some of your time today and a lot of, a lot of your insight from the past. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we've gotten a lot of historical information here on the wetlands and it's part in the city of Murfreesboro's history. Um, so the next episode we're going to do is going to be regarding the future and how we're going to daylight Town Creek. Our guest is going to be our assistant city engineer, Mr. Sam Huddleston. We're going to come and talk about the uh, daylighting of Town Creek project and how that's going to affect the wetlands. So we really do appreciate you watching and please stay tuned for our future episodes.